They are most of the day last week um, offering a series of, of blessings on different occasions, and it was lovely. So it's but it's good to be with you all today. Nice um, to know you're out the back. Oh. It's nice to have a civic life. Um, just a heads up for many of you all know uh, Pussy Swan well. You know, Pussy's uh, had a bad turn, and she's in the hospital. I saw her this morning. And so please keep her and the Swan family in your prayers. We're praying that she rallies and makes a full recovery. But, uh, but if not, I know she's as ready as any of us are to meet the Lord Jesus Christ up close and personal. So we're praying for her recovery, and we're praying God's will be done for her. But I wanted you all to know, because you're a, a woman of, you're women of prayer, and so I want you to join me in praying for her. Um, And then finally, looking ahead, we obviously don't meet next week. And then as we get into December, we will meet on probably the first few weeks. And perhaps we'll finish Philippians. And then I thought at our last thing, we'd have a great wrap-up. And then we would have a little holiday social. Does that sound good? Yes. I think we're due for that. I mean, things are getting better. We're still dealing with this stuff. I made contact tracing phone calls last night, right? But... It's much better than it was, and there's just, we're living our lives. Amen? Yes. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the privilege we have of being in your word. We pray, God, that you would you'd bless our time in your word. We pray, Lord, that as we open up um, this chapter of your scriptures, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts and that you would use our study to train us more and more to know Christ so that we might more faithfully follow him. We lift up our, our dear friend, your servant Pusey. We pray, Lord, that you would deal gently with her. We pray, God, that in your, in your mercy, Lord, that she would have a full recovery and that she would go home and enjoy this holiday and Advent and Christmas with her family. But God, if it's your will that this is her time to leave us and be with you full time, Father, we pray that that would happen. We would have them peacefully and painlessly. We lift her up to you and ask your blessing on her and her family and our study. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Ted introduced you all to the third chapter of Philippians, I think last week? Yes. So, you'll remember sort of where this goes. So, uh, the Apostle Paul has been addressing himself to this church in Philippi. It's a church that he knows well. Uh, it's a church that he founded. It's a church in a community that is a a Roman dominant community. So remember, Philippi is in Macedonia, which is north, northeast of Greece. Philippi particularly had an interestingly curious constituency because of public policy. So you think of the effect that public policy has on places. So you think about the state of Texas in the year, you know, what, in the 18, the mid 19th century. Right? In the state of Texas, there was this effort to start a, a, a university somewhere in the state of Texas that they would call the University of Texas. You know this story? And at that time, there were a number of places that were competing to be the place where they'd have the University of Texas. And Tyler was one of those places. Hadn't awarded it yet. And so there was an effort and a real push to establish Tyler as the place where the University of Texas was going to be located. And it so happens that they even named a street, they renamed a street, College Street, College Avenue, sort of as part of that PR push. Like when I was in school, they renamed a street called Jersey, they renamed it George H.W. Bush Drive. (laughs) I wonder why. And remarkably, about five years later, the Bush Presidential Library went to College Station. I wonder how that happened, right? So you think about public policy making a difference, right? In Philippi, public policy has made a massive difference in who lives in this town and therefore what kind of church this is, right? So you'll remember that the Romans, the Roman emperor made a choice to make sure that Philippi would be a place he wouldn't have to worry about in terms of insurrection, right? And so what they did is they incentivized retired Roman soldiers and their families to move to Philippi 
by saying if you move to Philippi, if you're a retired Roman soldier, there's no property taxes for you for life. And so a ton, you could imagine, of soldiers moved there and their families. Just like today, a lot of retired military people will look and say, where are the good VA hospitals? That happens today. Where are the good VA hospitals? We want to live there so we have access to affordable health care that's going to be of good quality for us. That still happens, right? So you think about incentivizing you know, people making, people's decision making based on public policy. That happened in Philippi. It matters for us because we know that that constituency meant that a couple things were true. One, there's, there's few if any Jews in Philippi. That's the first thing. And that's going to matter today as we look at the third chapter. And secondly, we know that with that constituency of a lot of Roman soldiers, we know historically that the dominant religion among the legions was emperor worship. So there's, remember, there's all kinds of religions in the Roman Empire in the first century. All kinds. They worship many, many gods. But there is one religion that is compulsory, and that is emperor worship. And so the way people live is the way we can't imagine, that they would basically... They would go to the temple of the emperor a couple times a year when they're supposed to go there. They would say their prayers. They would pay their tithe, if you will, their dues to acknowledge that they were there and support financially that temple. And then they would go to the temple that they went to the rest of the time. They'd go to the temple of Artemis. They'd go to the temple of Mithras. Or they'd go whatever. That's what people did, right? So it's almost like they, they worked. They, it was like a wink-wink. The difference, though, here is in Philippi, it would not have been the case that participating in the, in the cult of the emperor would have been just anecdotal in people's practice. With all these Roman soldiers, it would have been more normative. That temple would have been a more dominant and present part of their lives because of who they were and what their background was, right? And so we know from those worship services, because we have records of them, we know that the worship services for the emperor worship in Philippi and all other places had in their liturgy prayers and praises to the emperor as their lord and savior, right? And the consequence then of the introduction of Christianity in communities like Philippi was when people started to say Jesus Christ is the lord and savior, therefore the emperor cannot be the lord and savior, they created a confrontation. And it's a confrontation that led to persecution. And so that means a couple things. It means, one, that there's persecution that's happening in Philippi that this church is dealing with like it is in other places. Two, it's we understand a little bit about why there's persecution. And the third thing is, what happens when people are under persecution? So often there's, there's a couple responses when people are being persecuted for their faith. One is people crumble. One consequence when people are being persecuted for their faith is people walk away. They sort of say, this is not worth it. I'm going to do something else. And we know that happened a lot in the early church. But the second thing that can happen when there's persecution is people double down. It's like if I'm going to be persecuted for following Jesus, I'm all in. It, why would you be a lukewarm Christian in that environment, right? Right? Why would you be a lukewarm Christian if you can be killed, if your family can be persecuted for being a believer? I mean, it's like you're, you're with him or not. Are you with me? And so what happens is when people in their zeal for the Lord become that much more devoted, that much more committed, you're then looking for resources that are going to, like tools that are going to help you in your devotion. How do you grow? How do you get more serious? And inevitably, it pushes people to have a more zealous, passionate faith in the Lord. Which, at this time in history, would lead to people thinking, okay, what are some tools that can help me do that? So what we think is happening in Philippi is that there is a group of people that's probably not either, that not, maybe not from Philippi, but that is influencing people in this church to begin to take on some Old Testament practices as a sign of their commitment to the Lord. And the, the reasoning behind this is fairly understandable. The reasoning is, well, if there's one God, and it's the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New, and if the Old Testament is Holy Scripture, then if the Old Testament says, keep these rules to be in right relationship with God, why wouldn't you do that? Right? Especially when you're on the periphery of the emperor or the empire. You're not in Jerusalem. 
You're not in, in kind of the, the center of Christian life. You're literally on the edge of the frontier. You're, this is the Wild West in Philippi. So what, what seems to have happened in Philippi is there's been this introduction of these ideas that the way to really deepen your faith and demonstrate your passionate commitment to the Lord is by adopting these spiritual exercises. In this case, the spiritual exercises are keeping Torah, keeping the law of Moses. We do these things now in terms of our passion for the Lord moves us to keep spiritual exercises. We've always done that. I mean, in our church, we have a tradition of having the daily office. We have a prescribed way of keeping morning and evening prayer every day with other Anglicans all over the world using the same prayers, the same readings, having the same Apostles' Creed. We do it all the time. We do it in our church. Right? And there's nothing wrong with it. But what is that? It's a tool that's intended to help us to grow. So in this case, right, remember, they're all unchurched. They're all coming out of paganism. None of them have an Old Testament background. Their canvas is pretty clean. But it also means that they're open to suggestion from ideas from the outside because they don't come out of Judaism. So it's almost like they don't know. It's like the grass is always greener, right? They have not grown up with generations that were trying to be observant Jews under the law. And then they came to know Christ and somebody said, you don't have to keep kosher anymore. You can actually eat shrimp, right? You don't have to dress this way because you have freedom in Christ. And for most Jewish people that were converted, they were like, alleluia, right? But if you come out of paganism, where you've been kind of fast and loose forever in your choices, and now there's this more Puritan code of saying, here's a, here's a way to sort of do these things and you're going to be closer to God. Do these things and you demonstrate how committed you are to God, you can think about human nature. People say, sign me up for that. Especially people that are under persecution and that have been motivated to say, I'm all in with Christ, right? So I've already made that choice. I'm not going to backslide. I'm not going to go back to something else. Even if they're going to persecute me, I'm with Jesus. So how do I grow? How do I deepen my faith? How do I demonstrate my commitment to him? And in the middle of that, someone had come into the church, and we don't know who, but someone had entered into this church in Philippi and begun to influence them to try to keep kosher, to keep the law of Moses. And so we don't know the backstory, but we just know based on what we see in chapter 3, that's what happened. We also know that it happened in a lot of places. So Acts chapter 15, which I think we, we might have looked at before, but perhaps Father Ted walked you through it is, tells the story of the Council of Jerusalem, where this, it, this issue was addressed because it's an honest debate in the church in the first century about what do you do with the law of Moses in light of the gospel. So if, if the Old Testament is God-breathed and, and God inspired Moses to write the law, and the law says, first, on the eighth day you have to circumcise your sons, and if you're a man that becomes a Jew, you have to be circumcised, and your, your children and your wives and your daughters are going to be considered righteous or right with God through you, the men, being circumcised and keeping Torah, because women weren't circumcised, right? So women had to keep other elements of the law, but that definitive act of the law was not observed by women, obviously. So, you know, so these kind of practices were there in this, this debate in the church about, okay, so did God change it? Is God fickle? Did God change his mind? People, our immediate response is, no, God's not fickle. Therefore, why would God change the rule on circumcision and keeping Torah? And so there's a, it's a movement within the church in the first century to say, we have to continue to keep the law, right? And the issue was, wasn't Jesus circumcised? Yes. So there's the example. We need to be circumcised too. Didn't Jesus keep Torah? Yes. Wasn't he observant? Yes. Didn't he go for, to the Passover meals in Jerusalem? Didn't he keep the feasts and festivals? Yes. I mean, were there exceptions? Yes. We know that because the Pharisees often challenged Jesus for not observing to the T their interpretation of how to keep Torah. Remember all the stories from the gospel about that. But nevertheless, as a rule, Jesus was a rabbi that was observant of the law. And so this is the argument for this party within the church. Remember, this is within the church that says, you have to keep the law of Moses, beginning with circumcision and moving on. What happens in Acts chapter 15 is, 
St. Paul confronts that at a council with all the leaders of the church in Jerusalem called the Council of Jerusalem. And St. Paul goes to the Council of Jerusalem and says, this is a mistake, and here's why. If you teach that you have to keep the law, that you have to keep Torah to be right with God, you're completely undermining the gospel. If the essential claim of the church, if the teaching of Jesus is, if our core teaching is, we are saved through faith in him. And he already satisfied the demands of the law by shedding his blood on the cross. Then keeping the law is redundant. And furthermore, if you demand that people keep the law, what are you saying about the sufficiency of the work of Christ? You're saying what? It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. The cross wasn't enough. If you're saying you have to, to be righteous or right with God, you not only have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to keep all these rules. You are undermining the essential claim of the church that Christ died for your sins because that's no longer true. It's like, well, that was part of what needed to happen, but it wasn't enough. So it's like, okay, Christ died for your sins, and then also you have to keep the law to be right with God. Now you, you're teaching straight up works righteousness, right? The people are then going to be participate in their own acts of being made righteous by keeping the rules of Torah. And that's ridiculous. This is Paul's argument. Peter hears this and says, He's right. Turns to all of his other colleagues in Jerusalem. Remember, because Paul's off doing his own thing in Asia Minor. Paul makes a trip into Jerusalem where he never preaches and teaches. He goes into Jerusalem to have this conversation with the other leaders of the church. Because he's not one of the twelve, remember? He does his own thing, inspired by the Lord. And so, but when Peter turns to his other colleagues, James and the sons of Zebedee and all the others, and says, he's right, what happens? We know from Acts 15, the whole rest of the apostol apostolic council officially says, we understand and we agree. And they change, literally, it affects the permanent teaching of the church. The deal is, it's also true that there continued to be a minority party. So imagine going to a meeting, you've ever been to a meeting, where there's a division in the room, and somebody makes an argument, and everybody says, okay, okay, okay. But people walk out of that meeting and say, no. I know that's what we said, but I still disagree. You know, she might have won the argument. You know, she might have won the battle, but she's going to lose the war. You know, it's like, you know, and there's this effort to continue to hold on to your own ideas, right? And if you're passionate about ideas and you believe it matters, like this issue about how are you saved, what happened is there were leaders of the church that came out of that meeting in Jerusalem and sort of said, okay, this might be the official teaching, but the official teaching is wrong. And I'm going to make sure to give the right teaching, which is every Gentile that is converted needs to be circumcised and they need to keep Torah, period. And we know that that happened. We know that that happened because you see it in Galatians. You see it in other uh, New Testament letters where Paul continues to have to rebuke this idea that you must be circumcised. So this is a big deal. And it is at the heart of the faith. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be saved? This is not... Uh, a peripheral issue or a superficial issue. This is a core issue. And right here in chapter 3, you know, the Apostle Paul is going to confront it directly. And then after he directs, uh, confronts it with some pretty heavy words, then he's going to turn to the what? To the, therefore, here's what you do. So we're going to see here in this chapter, he begins the chapter with a direct rebuttal of some that are teaching falsely in the church in Philippi. So it's not... Remember, this isn't a rebuke of the Philippian church. What he's saying is there are some people that are entering into the Philippian church and trying to turn it the wrong direction. Because remember, Paul knows this church. He founded this church. He's their pastor. And it's like while he's been away in Rome ministering, someone else is coming into the church in Philippi and introducing different ideas that Paul says are undermining the gospel. And so Paul from afar, without naming names, is rebuking these influences that are coming into the church. Again, we don't know who these people are. They're not named, but and, and, and we, we presume these aren't people whom he knew well that were his friends, or he would have named them, right? And he doesn't name them here. He just calls them names. He calls them names. So he's hot, right? So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really powerful passage here in chapter 3. 
And we'll read through it all together. And, and I know you all started looking at chapter 3 last week. We'll really try to focus our attention on the second part of chapter 3 today. But we'll take a look at all of it. Okay, sound good? Tina, you want to get us started? We'll do two verses at a time. We'll read it, and then we'll walk through it together. Finally, my brother, to rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who, we who worship of the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason, reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything in loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I'm not sure where we are. We're in verse, uh, eight. verse 8b. Why don't we start at verse 8? 8. Okay. Uh, indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Choice. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to be have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also, that also to you. Truly, verse 16. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Lynn, can you pick it up from there, verse 18? For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who will transform our holy body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Thank you. So this begins with really a, a, a it's a curious turn, isn't it? It sounds like a conclusion. This chapter begins. And it sounds like he's about to wrap up the letter, doesn't it? Finally, and the word here that, that's used is the word adolfoi, which means brothers and sisters. He uses it three times in this chapter. It means brothers and sisters is the accurate translation. Finally, adolfoi, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. And then he turns to the rebuke. There is a debate, and Father Ted might have walked you all through this last week. There is a debate about whether actually Philippians is two different letters that are spliced together. 
And the argument is based on this right here. The argument is based on it's a type of criticism, like it's higher criticism called form criticism, where Bible scholars that spend their entire lives looking at the New Testament in the Greek look at it and say, this, it looks like somebody copy-pasted something in the middle of this letter, just like you would do. So imagine you're putting something together. You have two different letters to the same person. They're both written by you. But you copy-paste something from one letter into another one, and you put it in the middle. And it just doesn't read quite right. right? So that there's an argument that actually the flow here goes from chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 1. So you, it would read like this. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me, and is safe for you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, whom I love, love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat, and then the concluding comment. It flows that way, doesn't it? The challenge, though, is the word finally can be used in two different ways, and it is in ancient writing. So think about the forms that we have when we do our own letter writing. We have things that we, I mean, my kids are in school. They're trained in how to do letter writing, even now. It's like you put the date at the top, right? If it, whether it's formal or informal, it's like to whom or dear. You have your, your introductory remarks at the beginning, the content of the letter, then at the end sort of the goodbyes, and then sincerely, graciously, faithfully, thankfully, comma, your name, right? We have a form that we use. In the ancient world, it was true too. Their form that was different. And so the word finally in the ancient world in letter writing would serve one of two purposes. One, it would sort of introduce the concluding personal comments. Finally, you know, I hope things, I hope you have a marvelous Thanksgiving, and I hope you have the fattest turkey you've ever had, and that all the, the pies and cakes are delicious, and you have lovely weather in the Rose City, right? Da, 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 da. Thank you so much. Or, if you're making a series of arguments, finally is your last argument. So I've talked about this topic, I've talked about this topic. Now, finally, one more thing. Finally, I do want to talk to you all about. Rose Festival 2023. I think we might need to take a second look at that theme. I think the Rose Festival, you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, there's one more topic that I want to address in this letter that's about content, not closing remarks. And so there's a debate about whether finally here is supposed to lead us to closing comments, in which case this is a copy-paste job. It's two different letters, both written by Paul, both inspired by God. It's, it doesn't change the integrity of the letter. It just helps us to understand why it moves so abruptly. Or if actually the finally here is about he's got one more argument to make and he's going to introduce it here. It doesn't matter, big picture, but if you know, you're know you women of the Bible. If you're, as you're reading this and you think that sound, doesn't sound right, that's why. It would be one, one reason or the other. But let's look at the content. Finally, I write these things to you. It's no trouble for me and it's safe for you. But, and there's no but here, it just gets right into it. And it's very abrupt, isn't it? Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision. So he uses three different expressions. I would describe three different groups of people whom he's encouraging the Philippians to watch out for. Or it's three different ways of describing the same rascals. And they're all describing the same people. It's three different ways of describing them. Right? And my belief is it's the latter, not the former. He's not talking about three different groups. Oh, there's the dog party. There's the evildoer party. I think it's just he's piling on and rebuking one particular group of people. And he's calling them names. And this is what he calls them. First, dogs. Ted might not, might not have talked about this last week because it's hard for him to talk about. Because Ted is an unbelievable dog lover. He's a... Off, off the scales dog lover. Okay? I mean, sometimes, you know, he reschedules things because he's got to do things to take care of his dogs. He's, he's all in. And y'all might be there. You need to know that that is so anomalous compared to life in the ancient world. In the ancient world, dogs were not family pets. They did not function that way. In the ancient world, dogs were a nuisance more often than not. They were everywhere. And in cities in the ancient world, dogs were a pest. So, and dogs would make a mess. And dogs would eat anything. Dogs functioned in many ways like pigs. Right? They would eat garbage. They would eat refuse. 
It was just, uh, right? That's how dogs were. And I can see some of that. I mean, I, I had a situation, I had a situation a couple of years ago where I had a neighbor who I'd never met before, who was newer to our neighborhood, that came and knocked on my door one day, and I'd never met this person. And this person was not happy. And this person said, you need to know that your cat is coming over and going to the bathroom in front of my house. And my, and my dog is eating that cat's feces and then licking my grandchildren. And I don't like it. You can't make this up. You can't make this, this, is, this happen. This happened, right? And I didn't even know what to say. I mean, my cats are outside cats. My cats keep the rodent population in my neighborhood down. That's what they do. So I mean, there's no documented evidence that it was my cats. Our neighborhood is overrun with outdoor cats. They're everywhere. But nevertheless, it was odd. And the other, the other takeaway for me, because we don't have dogs, I thought is, wow, a dog would do that? Ooh, right? Ooh. So the ooh factor there is what's behind this insult of calling people a dog, right? Is when they don't, when, they, when he's calling somebody a dog, he's not talking about somebody that's the sweet family pet. He's talking about an animal that would eat another animal's feces, right? Just like, ugh. That's, that's why it's an insult for them. So he calls them dogs, evildoers, and then you get some specificity on what particularly they might be advocating that he's so upset about. And it's what? Mutilation. Yeah, mutilate the flesh. The word here, and I, I put it in your notes, people that mutilate the flesh are the people that are the people that are the katatome, which is basically, it's a word play on the word that's used for circumcision, right? Because the word katatome means to cut to pieces, and the word for circumcision means to cut around. It has the same root, but a slightly different meaning, right? And so the, the issue here pretty clearly seems to be that someone has come into Philippi and is teaching what? Circumcision. Why would they teach circumcision? They don't teach it for hygiene. They teach it purely because they're saying what? Same, that same old issue. You have to keep the law of Moses. Why would they do that? They would do that probably from a sincere motive. Now remember the people in, in Philippi, how many of them are Jewish? None. So none of them come from that. So they're, they're a blank canvas. So somebody comes in and says, this is the scripture, this is God's word, the, and they only had the Old Testament, and says, here's what the scripture says. Paul might not have told you this, but what the scripture says is, according to the law of Moses, you must da 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 and kind of laid it out. And then those people in Philippi that are zealous for Jesus, remember, they're facing persecution. So, you know, they're like thinking, what else do we, what other tools can we use? What else can we do to show how God, how sincere we are? How else do we grow? There's a, here's a ready-made platform for somebody to say, well, here's what you do. Here's an ABC 1, 2, 3 manual for holiness. Keep the law of Moses. Step one, circumcision. Step two, the rest of the law. That's what's happening. And Paul is hot. Hot. Because this isn't just happening theoretically. I, he's going to Jerusalem and confronting the apostles and saying this is a mistake. And says this is why you need to teach the cross and not teach circumcision. This is his own people. He led all these people personally to Jesus. He started this church, remember, with Lydia and her people on the side of the river. And in the jail with the jailer and all the prisoners. I mean, he knows them by name. He knows their nicknames. He knows their favorite colors. He knows what they like for dessert. He, he loves them. And so for him to, he, to hear that they're being led to have to keep Torah to be right with God, he is over the top. And therefore, he is laying in to the people that are introducing this bad teaching. They're dogs. They're evildoers. Right? They advocate mutilating the flesh. He didn't talk about circumcision. He refers to circumcision here as mutilation. Mutilation. And then he says the essential thing, for we are the circumcision. If circumcision, if you will, is, is an act through which somebody is righteous with God, is therefore the people of God, what is he saying? We are the circumcision. The circumcision now isn't a medical procedure. It's not a ritual act. Circumcision is now an allegory. It's an allegory for being right with God. And he says, we're it. You're already it. You are the circumcision. You don't have to be circumcised. 
God's already done that work for you on the cross. You were made right with God when Jesus died for your sins. You don't have to do circumcision for your eight-day-old babies anymore. Those days are over. You don't have to keep the law of Moses because Christ sacrificed the demands of the law by dying for your sins on the cross. And you can see, I mean, he is upset. And he's also correcting the bad teaching, right? And then, as if he's, you see, he's giving his little CV here. When he talks about himself, right? What does he say? Starting in verse 4. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the people of Israel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. This whole little resume that he's giving of himself. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because whoever's teaching circumcision is ultimately challenging whose authority? His. They're challenging Paul's authority as the expert on how to be a faithful Christian. And Paul's saying, whoever is coming in to Philippi and filling your minds with this garbage has, doesn't have anything on me. He's saying, I have a PhD in religion. Right? So whoever's coming in and introducing this thing, whatever dogs, evildoers are coming into Philippi and filling your minds with this rubbish. You know, remember who I am. Let me remind you of my own CV. Right? And the CV is what? Circumcised on the eighth day, meaning none of them were. Nobody in Philippi was circumcised. He's saying, I'm a lifer. I'm a I'm a, I'm a cradle Episcopalian, right? I've been doing this my whole life, right? I know more than you know. Secondly, I'm of the people of Israel, meaning I'm a part of the chosen people. I'm, I'm the chosen people. The people that you're reading about, that they're talk, talking to you about from the Old Testament, those are my people, right? I know way more about that than you do. Three, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, of the 12 tribes of Israel. Benjamin remembers the baby. Remember Benjamin? This is Jacob's youngest son who was loved. You remember that story? I mean, this is, this is the essential story, right? That, you know, the people of God uh, 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 are struggling, that there's a famine in the land, that they sold, you know, the, 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 the other favored son of their dad into slavery. And he makes his way into Egypt, you know, and there he is in Egypt and he, uh, he has the ability to, to interpret the dreams of the Pharaoh. He rises to effectively become the prime minister of Egypt. And then, you know, the, the famine continues to get pervasive in Canaan and is, before it's Israel. And his brothers all make their way to Egypt looking for food. This whole thing. And then what? I mean, ultimately, what, is, what does Jacob do? He uh, finds a way to do what? He, uh, he's reconciled to his brothers. Uh, and, 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 and the one brother that doesn't betray his brother is Benjamin. Benjamin is the good kid, right? So when he talks about himself as of the tribe of Benjamin, he's saying, I don't have a blemish on my ancestry going all the way back to the 12 tribes. It's like, I come from the best. I'm not just an Israelite. I'm of the best of the Israelites, right? I mean, remember Deuteronomy 33 describes the tribe of Benjamin as the tribe that is beloved of the Lord, right? That's who they are. And then he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Among, among my peers, I'm, I'm the top dog. I'm the best of the best. In regard to Torah, in regard to this idea of keep, remember Torah is the law, the same word. Torah means the law of Moses. Torah means the Pentateuch, the first five books. That's what it is. As it relates to Torah, which they're being taught, somebody's teaching them that Torah says you must keep, you know, you must circumcise and keep the demands of Torah. He says, I'm a Pharisee, meaning I'm an elite rabbi of Torah. There's nothing that these clowns can say to you that can, can, is bigger and, and more uh, 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 accurate than what I can teach you. I know more about Torah than they'll ever know. I have more training. I have more insight. Remember, to be a Pharisee meant that Paul had committed the entire Old Testament to memory. All of it. The entire Old Testament for Paul is committed to memory. It means that he also is trained in sort of the oral tradition, which is how do you interpret Torah? What rabbi said what about what Torah means in this circumstance and that circumstance? Paul has been trained in all of that, and he hasn't just been trained. He's been trained by Gamaliel. So his mentor is the most elite rabbi in all of Israel. So, I mean, he has an Oxford PhD in Judaism. And he's going through that, that CD with him right now, sort of saying, that's who I am. He's saying, I have an Oxford PhD in Judaism. 
Why would you listen to anybody that would come into Philippi and tell you something and tell you that, that I don't know what I'm talking about? If anybody knows what they're talking about as it relates to Torah and the law, it's me. And so he gives his whole CV, and then he says what? And this is where it gets beautiful, beautiful. He says, verse 7, whatever gain I had, i.e. whatever advantage I had, and he, here he's going to talk about gain and loss. He's using a metaphor of a financial statement, right? Gain and loss, profit and loss. That, those are the words that are used in Greek. So the analogy here is he's appealing to the Philippians as business people. He's using a metaphor or an analogy that's congruent with their experience. After all, who's the leader of the Philippian church? Who's the lay leader? Remember? Lydia. Remember? The lay leader of the Philippian church is Lydia. What does Lydia do? Yeah, she's in the textile business. She produces high-end textiles. She just she sort the, the, the she has the Louis Vuitton business to Philippi, right? That's what she does. So she knows all about profit and loss statements, and that's the analogy that he uses. Whatever gain or profit, exactly the same word in Greek. Whatever gain or profit I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever whatever. Whatever made it look like I was in the black, I counted it like I was in the red, right? Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss, what? For the sake of Christ. Next to Christ, all that stuff, all that education, all that advantage, all that background, all that status meant nothing. Meant nothing. Would it have meant nothing in Jerusalem? No. In Jerusalem, it would have been amazing. I mean, Paul's the guy, when he walks in the room, everybody knows he's there. Right? He's the one, there's a civic function. He walks in the room, everybody wants to be around him. He's at the head table, right? He's at the head table. The mayor has a seat beside him. He is the influential guy. He is the alpha in the room. That's who he is in Jerusalem when he's a Pharisee. When he's part of, when, in, in the old self, when he's Saul of Tarsus, that's who he was. He is the man, right? So he gets all the advantages of that. Everything that comes with that. Every Every grandmother in Jerusalem wanted their, you know, their granddaughter to marry him. That's who he is, right? And what does he say about all that? I do what? Whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. None of that meant anything. And then, and then indeed, verse 8, I count everything as a loss. Again, using that profit loss analogy of the financial statement. I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Is that everything else, compared to knowing him, everything else doesn't. It's, it's like it's a loss. Does that mean he doesn't care about other people? Does that mean he doesn't care about his parents? No, he still cares about those. But he says, in comparison to knowing Christ, there is nothing. They're just, they're, they're, they're so small compared to how huge it is for me to know Christ. That's the point of view that he's trying to share. For his sake... I have suffered the loss, continuing that metaphor, I have suffered the loss of all things. Right? And so think about his life. From Saul of Tarsus, right? The Pharisee studying with Gamaliel, who's leading the effort to destroy the church because they thought that the church was the threat to Judaism. Right? To what? To Paul, the itinerant preacher among strangers in Macedonia. I mean, who's he? He's writing this to the Philippians. Had he ever been to Philippi before? Did he have? Did he? Was he going on holiday in Philippi? Did he know people in Philippi? Is there something beautiful to see in Philippi? Is it like, oh boy, the Philippi is where you have the, they have the best mai tais in Philippi. You gotta go there. I mean, is there anything? I mean, no. There's no reason to go to Philippi. There's no reason. I mean, it's like, and I don't mean to insult them, but it's like if if you have people in Des Moines. Des Moines is wonderful. But if you think, well, you know what, honey, this year for vacation, Des Moines, Iowa. That's the place. Let's go. Des Moines is where it's at. It's so beautiful, right? It's, it, there's a lovely view. Of the mountains are there. The beaches are there. The museums are amazing. It's filled with Michelin star restaurants, the canals. It's just charming. Would that make any sense at all? No, right? So Paul's ministry, missionary trips are like that. He doesn't go to Venice. He doesn't go to Santa Barbara. He doesn't go to San Diego. 
He doesn't go to Naples. He doesn't go to Vail. Right? What does he do? He goes to Lincoln. Right? He goes to Gilmer. Right? He goes to Des Moines. Right? He goes, he goes these places because he goes for the people. There's nothing else that he goes for. He goes for people. It's all about the people that live in those places. He doesn't go for anything else. He doesn't spend his spare time doing anything else. He just does that. That's all he does. So when he says what? I have lost everything because what's the price he's paid for that? Is he married? Does he have children? Does he have a retirement plan? What about his relationship with his parents? What would that have been like now? Right? He was their shining star. What did he do? As far as they're concerned, he did what? Threw it all away. Now he's a criminal. Right? And what's happened to him is he's traveled all over the world. How is he received in these places? Oh, it's the rock star. Here we go. Oh, it's Paul. He's amazing. What happened last time he was in Philippi? He got beaten up by the police and thrown in jail. Right? Where is he writing this letter from? Jail, jail in Rome. I mean, this, so when he says, I count everything as a loss for the sake of birth, it's not theoretical. It's not theoretical. It's real. For his sake, for the sake of Christ, I have suffered all things and I count them as rubbish. What he's saying is, yeah, I'm paying a huge price, but you know what? All those things that I lost, compared to Christ, it's rubbish to me. Which for me is, I could never say that. I could never say that. You know, I, I, my wife, my children, you all, my family. No, it's dear to me. It's jewels of pearls of great price, right? For Paul, though, it's like, no, none of those things matter for him. What matters is Jesus Christ and his mission to, to share the good news with people. That's it. He is so single-minded and locked in on that, that all the other things that he doesn't have, all the things that he's given up, he doesn't have second thoughts. He doesn't look back and say, oh, what could have been? Oh, I wonder if she still thinks about me. Oh, he doesn't do that. He's just completely focused on Christ. And this is it. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. The word there for rubbish can also be translated dung. Dung. It's the same word. It can mean trash, or it can mean dung. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, and notice he doesn't say by him, it's in him. This is about identity, that my life might be found in Christ. And he says in other places, what, what does he say? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's this, it's this idea that you get in the Gospel of John of abiding in Christ, finding your life in Christ. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Find your life in me. That's what this idea is, to be found in him. To find your identity, your purpose, your worth, your value, your name, everything in Christ, not in the world. So he's not finding himself and his identity in his job, in his family, and what people think about him, and what a good you know, backgammon player he is. None of those things, right? None of those things. It's like his identity, his purpose, is, everything about him is found in knowing Christ. That's it. That's his identity. I am a Christian. It's like, that's all you need to know about me. All you need to know about me is I am a Christian. Not my race, not my language, not my family name. I am a Christian, that's it. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, like those clowns, those dogs, those evildoers are telling you, right? That you're going to be made righteous by keeping the law. No, no, no. Not having a righteousness that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Righteousness comes from what? From Christ, faith in Him. A righteousness from God, right? It's not a righteousness that I produce by keeping the rules of Torah. It's a righteousness that comes as a gift from God. A righteousness from God that depends on faith. So the righteousness that comes from God doesn't just happen to everybody. There is a work, right? There is a work. There is something I must do to be made righteous by, by the blood of Jesus. But that thing that I must do is have what? It's not circumcision. It's not keeping Torah. It's not following the Ten Commandments. Right? Those things follow faith. You have faith, and then you're motivated to want to follow Christ faithfully. Right? Which means you say no to those other things and yes to Jesus. But doing those things doesn't make you righteous, Paul is saying. Because remember, that's the teaching of Judaism. You do these things, you're counted righteous. Paul is saying that's rubbish. That's not accurate. 
You're made righteous by Jesus. You have faith in Him. That's your righteousness. And then what follows is, you're going to choose to do these things faithfully because of who you are. But it's going to come from the heart. It's not simply going to become because you're, you think you're going to save yourself. So he says what? That which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, verse 10, that I may know Christ and the power of His resurrection, and I may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I mean, here, for me, verse 11 is sort of the high watermark, and it is difficult because what he's saying ultimately is, I'm committed all in. If following Jesus means I'm going to be tortured and put to death, so be it. I'm going to follow Jesus. That's his point of view. And it's a point of view that has massive integrity because of the whole story of Paul's ministry in Philippi and now even the story of this letter. Right? Because the story of his ministry in Philippi is what? He's not only willing to endure suffering, but he does endure suffering. And it doesn't move him to leave. I mean, what happens? After he's beaten and put in prison for proclaiming the gospel and ministering, especially this demon-possessed slave girl that he exercises the demon, remember, by an act of God, the walls of the jail come down? A reasonable person who's not from Philippi, who's wrongly in there, is going to do what? Mm -hmm. I'm out of here. (laughs) <laughs> Let's get back to Turkey. Let's get back to Asia Minor. Let's go somewhere where they're not going to come at me. What does he do? He says, come on, gentlemen. Let's stay. Let's stay and sing songs. What? Let's stay and have a Bible study. Let me tell you about the love of Jesus. That's what happens. Remember, the jailer runs up and acts and thinks that everybody's going to have left because the earthquake made the walls of the prison come down. They're still there. They're still there having prayer and praise with Paul. So when he talks about what? Suffering, huh, I count it as a loss for the sake of Christ. It's not theoretical. And they know it in Philippi. Because the people that are reading this letter the first time, they were in the jail with him in Philippi. They know that they and he could have all left, but they didn't because he chose to stay to tell them about Christ and to lead them to Christ and to nurture their faith. It's amazing. So when he talks about sharing and sufferings like Christ, what he's saying is, The model for us from Jesus is you are willing to suffer for the sake of love for other people. The whole gospel, he says, is what? God is our suffering servant. That God so loved the world that he gave. He said earlier in chapter 2 in the hymn, he did what? He emptied himself. He didn't see equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and being found in human likeness did what? Suffered death on a cross. The whole model for him is, it's not that you love suffering. It's not masochistic. It's that you are prepared to take whatever it costs for the sake of being faithful to God. And God is demanding of Paul and of the church in Philippi that they're faithful to him, even if it means they deal with suffering. And therefore, let's go, he says, becoming like him in his death. Like, if I'm killed for the sake of being faithful, well, that's what happened to my Lord. That's what happened to my Lord. And so if that's that's my future, then so be it. Because that's the model for me. That's how all in he is with saying it's only Jesus and that's my whole identity and nothing else matters for me. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's to me, it it is the it's it's the essential role model. If the first role model for faithfulness is Abram and Sarah, remember? Abram and Sarah living in Haran. God speaks a word to them and sort of says, you need to follow me. And Abram says, yes, sir, and just goes. He doesn't have a map. He's not given directions. There's no Expedia method. There's no Google Maps. Every single day, he's just faithfully going wherever God leads him. That's the first model for, wow, how hard would that be? That's amazing faith. The next model is the penultimate model, which is Christ himself who is totally faithful to his own mission, even when it led to suffering and death. And Paul says, therefore, that's our model too. We're going to be faithful to him no matter what. And then, you know, he's he's talking about his hope that one day, as he's faithful, he will be raised from the dead. And then verse 12, not that I've already obtained this, i.e. this kind of faith, right? He's almost like he's saying, 
This faith that I'm talking about is aspirational. It's like, this is the vision. This is who I want to be. This is my desire. And it says, I'm not totally there. I, you know, I have my moments. Not that I've already obtained all this or I'm already perfect, he says. I, I make mis- I'm still fall short. But I do what? I press on to make it my own. I keep going. I'm hopeful that the next day I'm going to be more like Jesus. I'm going to grow more every day. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Because he has chosen to claim me and adopt me as his child, I am deeply and completely committed to continue to move forward and press on with him no matter what. And the metaphor he has now is that of the athlete to press on. To press on. Like the athlete. And it's, a, it's an analogy and a metaphor that he uses in other places. Right? And I put this in your notes. Hebrews 12, 2 Timothy 4, Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians 9. These are all places where you get this metaphor of the Christian as the athlete, right? Who is, you know, I mean, I don't deal with it now because I'm, I'm no athlete anymore. But my kids are. And so, you know, I, I think I've told you all, I mean, I have kids that run cross country in school. And so I see them, you know, they're coming around that corner and all the other kids. And I'm, I'm like well, all the other parents. I'm cheering for every single kid when they're in that last half mile and they're just exhausted but I'm cheering them on to finish. That's, it's a, that's finish. Let's finish. You see these kids, there's the kids that are just desperate to walk. They're desperate to walk. But they know that everybody's watching. And so you can see them just try to bring that last ounce that they have to sort of say, let's, let's finish. That's what he's talking about. Right? I press on. I'm going to continue. It's, this, you know, it's that last mile. I'm going to go for it. Why? Because Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider, and brothers and sisters, he says, Adolfoy, <clears throat> I haven't made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead, again, that metaphor of the athlete at the finish line, right? Straining across the line, straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize, again, that same metaphor, the athlete in the games. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God. In Christ Jesus. The prize is what? Christ Jesus, Christ. Christ Jesus and faithfulness to his call. That's the prize. That's the prize. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So when he says, let those who are mature think this way, how would that, how would that be heard among the Philippian church. After all that he said here in chapter 3. They hear this. Those that are mature think like this. They're, they're sitting there thinking what? They're mature. Yeah, it's like. And, 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 and those that were tempted. By this false teaching. That they now they need to circumcise their boys. They need to keep Torah. Now they're thinking. That was a mistake. I'm going to put that behind me because. I want to be a mature Christian. Remember, this is the Philippian church. This is a healthy church, right? This is a church that's being, some in the church are being influenced to go in a different direction in understanding the gospel, to introduce keeping the law of Moses into their spirituality. And Paul is rebuking that and saying that's rubbish faith, that's bad teaching, that's a dead end faith. Because it's all about the gospel and Jesus Christ and his death for you. You're saved through him. You are the circumcision. You are the people of God. You have nothing to prove. But devote yourself to Christ. And he says, those that are mature, this is your focus. Your focus is what? Christ. Not the law. Not the rules. Christ. Christ alone. Make him your focus. Right? And so if what follows naturally is, okay, if Christ is your focus... Therefore, there's things that you're going to do differently. That's great. Right? If the focus is, you're all in on Jesus, therefore, you're going to make these choices. Wonderful. But that's not the same thing as, okay, do this checklist and you're a better Christian. Right? It's a different thing. It's one thing to say, the focus is Jesus Christ himself. Knowing him, following him, devotion to him. And then, he's going to lead me and show me what I can do to be a better Christian. That's not the same thing as, okay, here's my five-point plan to spiritual maturity. I do these five things, I'm a strong Christian. And he's saying that is rubbish, right? And so, so if you're mature, he says, and you're here, verse 15, let those of us who are mature think like this. Keep your eyes on Christ. 
And if in anything you think otherwise, and this is where he's so gracious to them, if you, you know, if you still disagree, God will reveal that to you also. God's going to let you know. Right? He doesn't sort of say, he doesn't say, because you know, you think after everything else he said, he would say, if anything else you think otherwise, like if you still disagree with me, you're an idiot. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? If in anything else you think otherwise, if you disagree with me, God will reveal that to you. God's going to make it clear. I, you know, I've said my piece. I've told you what you need to know. I know who you are. You love Jesus. I'm going to leave it to the work of the Holy Spirit. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. What we have attained is what? Our faith and the maturity level of the Philippian church. It's like, stay true to who you are, right? Don't backslide. Don't go back. Don't get on the wrong track. It's just a beautiful word that, you know, it reminds us that even in a strong, healthy church like Philippi, what can happen? People can go in the wrong direction. That can, that, that's true anywhere, isn't it? That's true anywhere. That's true for any of us. It's like, there but for the grace of God go I. And that was true for them too. So it's, it's also a reminder, a big picture for me, on the, the principal teaching in Philippians 3 is, it's all about Jesus. Right? Your identity is in Him. Your life is in Him. Your focus is on Him. He is first, second, and third. He is the priority. And then from there, you, everything else comes. You make other choices. You think about your life in other ways. But as long as that's true, that the focus is on Christ and knowing Christ and following Christ, things will sort themselves out. And that's a hopeful word. Amen? Yes. Well, ladies, I hope you have a fantastic Thanksgiving. We'll close in prayer and I'll let you go. The Lord be with you. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for time and your word. We pray, God, that you would help us to be people who have our eyes constantly on Christ. And that you'd help us more and more to continue to grow and mature to be focused completely on Him, devoted utterly to Him, and that then you would lead us, Lord, in how else we're to live. Therefore, you'd show us what we need to do, where we need to go, who we need to be. We're so grateful, Lord, for your blessings on us, and we pray, Lord, for ourselves, our families, and our community. I pray for these wonderful women, that you bless them all with a marvelous Thanksgiving week, that you continue to protect them against danger and sickness, and nurture us with your favor. We ask your blessing on our churches, our families, our community, and our country. We pray all these things gratefully in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. God bless you all. Yes, ma'am. Frida. Um, with your introduction, would this congregation be made up of the retired Roman military? It's inevitable there's going to be. If there's not, there's going to be both retired Roman military families that are part because it's such a huge constituency. And or the influence of that on the DNA of the community is still going to be the church. So it's almost like even if those families themselves aren't in the church, the influence that that mentality has on the community, because people who live in Philippi choose to live in Philippi. They can move somewhere else. It's almost like if you're in a community where these are the cultural values, if you can't stand it, you, you, you go somewhere else. And so people there still have a mentality, though, that would be massively affected by the DNA of this being a retired Roman military town. So I'm thinking, with the military mind, the idea of rules and regulations. 100%. So would that appeal to them more? Absolutely. And that's, so you think again about why would it be that, they would, that somebody would seek to introduce observing Torah as a spiritual practice. And why would it be the Philippians would be susceptible to thinking that's a good idea? I think Freddie, you're exactly right. That a mentality, a military mentality, I mean, I grew up, my dad was an ICBM launch officer. I grew up in a military family. I was born on an Air Force base. I completely understand that mentality. Of just, we're still law and order, straight up, rule-based people. And you're susceptible to wanting to sort of ABC one, two, three, this is the plan, let's go, as opposed to having nuance and gray and a broader discernment. It's, just, it's in the DNA. Yeah. But with that mentality, I think his, his letter here is, is very, very well directed towards that. He's, he's establishing who he is that's right. and he, that they have a right to respect him and listen right. to what he says. I think that's right. He reminds them of his own. And, and you wonder also, it's like when you're, you know, 
Uh, you wonder when Paul was, was first getting to know these people, did he give them his CV? Yes. Or, or when he was first with them, did he kind of, did he not tell them? Because what would it mean to them? Right? I mean, they're Philippians. They're, they're not, they don't know Jews. They don't know Judaism. So the significance of him being with Gamaliel and the Pharisees and all that, what would, they wouldn't even know what those things, they wouldn't know how to sell Pharisee in Philippi. It's not on their radar. None of them are Jews. None of them. So it's like all these internal debates that they're having in, in Jerusalem, that's like another world for Philippi. So I wondered also, looking at this, if, if he had not really laid out his own qualifications, and sort of who he was until somebody else is presuming to be an expert in the law. And then he says, wait a second. You need to know this, that I have way more authority as it relates to the law of Moses than those dogs will ever have. <laughs> so I wondered if this was reminding them of his resume or introducing them to the resume for the first time. I wondered, just thinking about relationally what that would look like. So... Go in peace. God bless you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too.